right. Welcome, everybody, to another lovely Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. hey. Woo. Good to be in the house of the Lord, right? Amen. Hey. Amen. All right, so we just have a few announcements to go over today. One, um, nobody's a visitor, but once again, if we have visitors, we want to point them over to the put out the visitor card so we can stay in contact with them. And which, you know, really need to try to get some visitors in here, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, so let that be in the forefront of your mind even throughout the week because the people that come in contact with our visitors, you know, you never know how many people actually don't have, you know, a church home, a church family. You know what I'm saying? That really are going through life by themselves. You know what I'm saying? And I guarantee we all got people around us that's just like us. We may not know it, but we do. You know what I'm saying? So just just kind of take the initiative, you know, and just say, hey, you know, spark up a conversation or whatever. Um, two, reminder of the Bibles, which are on the table. For those that may forget their Bible or for, you know, first timers that, you know, may not come with one, they're always accessible. So feel free to grab one. Also, the giving link. Um, has everybody tried it out? Okay. It's, it's pretty solid. It works. It's simple. I like it. Because I don't have to worry about going to the bank, taking money out, and all that stuff. It's just like, dumb, dumb. I like it like that. So that, that's awesome. I'm glad we were able to get that going. Mm -hmm. Saves time and everything else. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Also, Housebook 2.0 Facebook page. Woo that's awesome. Yes. Yeah, it's just been awesome just to, even for me to just see, you know, the sponsors. So that's awesome. Like every day it pops up. That's that's good. That keeps it in the forefront of my mind. So I know it does in front of others that see it. You know, so that's great. I'm glad that that's up and running. Um, and you guys, if you're not part of it, you need to be a part of the page, like it, share it. You know what I'm saying? So people that you know will know what's going on as well. And that's how we do it. That's really how we get the word out, you know, so just constantly keep that in our minds. Also, um, baptism signups will be until next Sunday, October 22nd. And then the following Sunday is when we'll actually have them. So we're giving you that week's time so you can see we have the t-shirts and whatever mm -hmm. needed in preparation for that. So that's something we should be excited about too, which that will be, um, the baptism will be Right after service next Sunday. I mean, the following yeah. Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then, you know, we got the. Um, Sprinkle them with the water hose. <laughs> <laughs> make it quick, right? Yeah. Let's... <laughs> right. And then we also have. <laughs> yes, exactly. I want to make sure y'all remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. And make sure that you invite people. So, we have a busy Sunday on the 29th. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. But it's going to be fun and exciting. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do my best to preach short. Yeah, we'll just, yeah, we'll just be my best. If, if everybody's in faith, it might actually work. Right. Now, if it, if it doesn't happen, we know somebody wasn't in faith. So, <laughs> so it's on us. But yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, so last but not least, we know the holidays are approaching fast, which, yeah, to me, once September hits this holiday. Right. Um, We're going to run a food drive of non-perishable food items, um, and we'll have a collection box that will be starting next week. So I imagine that'll be on our lovely table as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that we will be partnering with The Rock for their food pantry and also looking to bless a few families in the community with those non-perishable items. So that's awesome, you know. Um, at, how's it go? Uh, many hands make the work life. Yep. I don't know if I said it right. That's close enough. Right. But, um, but that is so true. You know, the more, it's not so much how much we do or how much we give as, as it is that we do for the community. Because every little thing counts. I mean, if you come in with one can, you know what I'm saying, that's a blessing to somebody that doesn't have one can. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So it's always that constant reminder that even in the little that we may feel that we have from time to time, we still got more than that. You know, so, it, and, and God, I promise you, God, the community will bless you as you are a blessing to others. That's what he's called us to do. And that's the end of the announcements. That's bro. it. That's it. Let's go ahead and get this thing rolling. Um, again, just keep in mind that we're blessed to be a blessing, right? And like you said, most of us here, we already have more than a lot of other people. 
There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We already have more. And if we are stingy with what we have, we're not going to get any more. It, 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 what we have is what we'll get. But the Bible also says if you're like that and you're stingy, even that which you have will end up being taken away. It's interesting how that works out. It seems like those that, you know, they seem like they can never get enough, never get enough, never get enough. But are you trusting God with what you got? Or are you hanging on to it saying, well, I'll trust you with this much, but I'm going to hold on to the rest. You know, again, I, I love what Lester Summerall said. You know, he was talking about the offering plate going by, and he looked out, and he said, man, I see angels. And everyone's like, what do you mean you see angels? He goes, I see angels. You know, they're watching. And they're watching what? He goes, as you're putting in the offering plate, he's watching what you're holding back. He goes, because whatever you're holding back is what you're not trusting God with. I'm like, wow. And it's a good principle. You know, because ultimately, if he filled your pockets to begin with, won't he do it again? Right? So it, it isn't how much you give out. It's how much do you trust God with. It, it, it isn't the amount. It's the level of trust. Right? We get caught up on the amount. Well, if we're God's kids, we're in the kingdom, then everything of the kingdom is ours. And he's the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So uh, I don't think we're in a position of lack as a king's kid. You ever seen a kid, king's kid lack anything? No. They have it above and beyond. Right? Well, we're the king's kids. We don't have lack. We're part of the kingdom. We don't operate in lack. But we've been trained that way. We've been taught that way all of our lives. Well, most of us have. At least a good portion of it. We've been taught that way. And it's the retraining process is terrible. <laughs> it's going back through that. Especially once you see the truth of Scripture. Once you see the truth of Scripture, it tends to make you mad because you're like, wait a minute. How come I was never taught this way? Again, people's experience becomes their doctrine. Versus the Bible being their doctrine and let their experience grow into the Lord, right? Either way, let's go ahead and get started this morning. We're going to pray and we're going to jump right into it this morning. So Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. Uh, We thank you for the opportunity to be here, to fellowship one with another, to fellowship with you, Lord. Uh, It is such a blessing just to be here, just to have the opportunity, God, and to be able to share your word, to be able to share life with our family here, God, and to be able to share online to those that will listen online, God, it, it is a blessing to be able to do that because there's many places where that's not possible. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity and privilege we have, Lord, and let us not squander the time that we have and the opportunities that we have. Let us not let those things just pass by and lose those opportunities. Father, let us be diligent in those things. Let us be aware of every opportunity, Lord, as we're constantly being led Those are the sons of God. That's what your word says. So, Lord, let us constantly be being led. And, uh, Lord, we want to honor your word. We want to honor your truth, honor your spirit, and who and all that you are, Father, and everything that we say and do. So, Lord, take today, take your word, multiply it as seeds in the lives of those that are here and those that will watch later. And, Lord, we just thank you for that opportunity to sow, and, Lord, and to love and to become love. Lord, so we just bless you this morning. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I am going to also be working on talking slower as much as possible, uh, giving you a chance to find the addresses as much as possible. Um, Again, let's work on our prophetic, and it'll make all of our lives easier. You'll get there before me. So if you would, go ahead and open up to John chapter 6, starting in verse 26. Because we've been working on our identity in Christ, been working on who we are, and that's going to pretty much come up just about every sermon. So I'm just letting you know now so you don't like, oh, wow, it's always the same thing. It's probably going to be very similar most sermons. Your identity in Christ and who you are in Christ is your key to unlocking every potential opportunity available to us in the Scriptures, in the Word of God, in this life that we call Christian, right? If we don't know who we are in Him, we'll never operate in that, ever. We won't operate at least to the fullness that we can. Because if we don't know who we are, we won't know how we can operate. If you don't know you have something, you don't know you have it. So if you don't know you have it, you can't very well utilize what you don't know that you have. Right? Uh, Brother Curry was talking about his vehicle that he had for a long time that had an automatic start. that would you know start the vehicle and start warming up the vehicle or cooling down the vehicle. And he says he didn't know he had it until his son went out there and got everything ready to go. And Curry comes out like, who started the car? And his son looks at him, you didn't know it did that, did you, Dad? And he goes, it starts the car, and it starts running. He goes, you mean I could have been doing that 
for over a year instead of going out there and freezing. And the vehicle could have already been started and warming up, and I could have waited inside. He goes, mm -hmm. he goes, didn't know it. And that's where we, we struggle sometimes. We don't know what we have. We don't know that we can use what we have. Because why? We don't get an owner manual, and we wait on someone else to tell us what it says. It's important that we get an owner's manual and tell, figure out what it says and utilize all of our uh, options, as it were, all of our uh, benefits, accessories. It's always good. But it's interesting that Jesus said that we are as he is. If we are as he is, and his current state is seated at the right hand of the Father, he's no longer in flesh form, but we are as he is in this world, it's about time we start walking like it, talking like it, acting like it, right? Even if we don't necessarily feel like it, or we don't necessarily think like it. Why? It's a growing process. Because until you start operating in it and start stretching yourself in it, you're only going to go to a certain point. Um, I was actually talking about this earlier with Amanda before everybody got here. You know, you are living what you believe. Did you catch that? You are living what you believe. People said, I wish I could live the life that I believe. You are. Because the level of your belief is exactly what you're operating in. You may want to believe other things, and you may desire to believe those things, but you're not actually at the place of believing them. You might agree with them. You might like the concept of it, right? You might be attaining to that. But your level of belief is where you're living. So what do you got to do? You got to stretch. You got to reach, and you got to take that level of belief and put it into action, because what faith without works is dead being alone. You have to put feet to your faith. It's okay to have faith, but if you ain't doing nothing with it, then what is good is it? So you start putting feet on your belief, and guess what's going to happen? You're going to start seeing results. You can't say, oh, I believe that. Well, what are you doing about it? Uh, <laughs> if you ain't doing nothing about it, then you probably really don't believe it. Because you will do what you believe. You will step out. If you believe, you will do it. Who got out of the boat? Peter. Why? Because he believed. And the only thing he did, what did he believe? The word of Jesus. They said, well, you come. Jesus said, all right, come on. So Peter got out of the boat at the word. Come on, come to me. If we will start operating that just as what he says and do what he says, if he says come, okay, I'll just go do it. That's it, get out of the boat. Who else got out of the boat? Nobody. Even John, the one that Jesus loved. That he made a very big point of saying that in every one of his things. The disciple who Jesus loved. Funny, you didn't get out of the boat. Twice you didn't get out of the boat. Peter jumped out of the boat twice. Once to meet him on the seashore to have breakfast, and the other time to walk on the water. That was Peter. He said, you know what? I may not be perfect, but I'm getting out of this boat. How many of you hesitate because you don't feel you're perfect? You don't feel you're adequate? You don't feel that you're worthy? You don't feel whatever you put in the blank? You don't feel you're qualified? <laughs> You don't have the training. You don't have the expertise to get out of the boat. Did Peter have the expertise to walk on water? <laughs> no. <laughs> but he got out and walked on water, didn't he? Why? Because he took Jesus at his word and just did what was needed to be done. So we're going to talk about being the same as Jesus. Because let's face it, you are Jesus today. Jesus is living inside of you. You're basically the glove on the outside of Jesus. And who you touch, he touches. And the sooner we start settling this, and how we speak to people is Jesus speaking to people. This will start transforming all of our lives. Why? Because we'll start operating as sons without hesitation. So John 6, starting in verse 26. Now, I'm reading out the Amplified just because it hammered it down. And I went back and checked a few translations to make sure that the Amplified was actually accurate. Because uh, sometimes the Amplified is good, but it takes its you know the source type stuff a little too different direction than what the original text says. But this time it was actually spot on, so I, I stuck with it. So it says, Jesus answered them, I assure you, most solemnly, I tell you, you have been searching for me, not because you saw the miracles and signs, but because you were fed with the loaves and were filled and satisfied. So what happened? Jesus performed the miracle with the loaves and fishes, and now everybody's wanting to follow him. But not because of the miracle, but because they got fed. All right? So Jesus has a tendency to call people out on their true motives, even if they may not realize it. He will call them out. He doesn't do it to be mean. He's like, but you need to understand where you're at. It's actually love that he says anything. 
But how many people come to Jesus because Jesus got them out of a sticky situation? But that's the only reason why they come to him. They don't come to him for relationship. They come because Jesus keeps getting me out of sticky situations. It's about relationship. It ain't just because he did a miracle or just because he, you were what filled with the loaf and satisfied. You see how that applies to so many different areas, being filled and satisfied with those certain things, but you don't actually come for the relationship aspect? How many people have we had in our lives that didn't come to us for a relationship? They just come for us what we could offer. Right? People do that. That's okay. We can be God. We can take care of that because what? There is grace that goes to all. And we should show love. We should show that grace. But there comes a point that we're going to have to start discipling. If they keep coming, that's an opportunity to disciple. What? So they start learning to fish for themselves instead of depending on you to give them a fish. Right? Let's keep going. Verse 27 says, Stop toiling and doing and producing for the food that perishes and decomposes in the using. But strive and work and produce rather for the lasting food which endures continually unto life eternal. The Son of Man will give furnish you that. For God the Father has authorized and certified him and put his seal of endorsement upon him. So he says, look, you guys are working for things that are going to perish. How many things in life do we toil for and we go after at the end of the day is going to leave us empty? Right? I was having a conversation this week with somebody and I asked the question, whose kingdom are you building? That's something we have to consider in everything that we do. Whose kingdom are we building up? Because the scripture says in Matthew 6, to what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So what is that? I'm seeking kingdom first. Above everything else, his kingdom, not my kingdom, his. But too many people want to build their own kingdom and think they're walking with God. And they think because they enacted business practices that built their business, that somehow God has blessed them. No, you did things of the world and the systems of the world in that sense do work, right? So you got blessing because you followed a system. You weren't walking in faith, you were following a system. I'm not knocking systems, so don't think I'm just shutting everything down when it comes to systems. What I'm saying is, they're thinking that it was all God and they're building God's kingdom. In reality, at the end of the day, if you get back to the heart motive, it wasn't about God's kingdom, it was about your kingdom. Because you were looking for comfortable. You were looking for all these different things that God can absolutely provide for you, but we get caught in the circle of trying to do it ourselves and not trusting God. And when we're not trusting God, then who have we made God? Ourselves. Seek first the kingdom of God. Because he goes, he's asked the question, why do you stress for these things? Why do you worry about these things? Why do you, are, are you so focused on these things that are going to perish? Go to the eternal. Seek the eternal things. If we're going to strive for something, we strive for that. But the Bible says what? To labor unto rest. If we're going to work, we work to rest, not work to toil and just work and just drain ourselves. Again, this comes back to operating out of the spirit or operating out of the flesh. If you're operating out of the flesh, you're going to get tired. You're going to get wore out. People can wear you out. Life can wear you out. So many different things can take you down when you're operating out of the flesh. It's when we step, you know what? Nope, mm -mm, nope. I'm going to step right back into the Spirit and let the Spirit take this. Why? Because the Spirit never runs dry. Amen? Because it's life eternal. And who furnishes that? We just saw it. Jesus. All right, so. And they asked this question. What then, they said, what are we to... What are we to do that we may habitually or continually be working the works of God? What are we to do to carry out what God requires? <laughs> Jesus replied, this is the work, the service that God asks of you. That you believe in the one whom he sent, that you cleave to, trust, rely on, and have faith in his messenger. This is one of those things that could have answered the question we were talking about the other night. What, what do we do to do the works of God? How do I know that I'm doing what God wants me to do? The answer is right there. Jesus himself said it. You want to know that you're doing what God requires? Believe and trust upon the one whom he sent. And that's Jesus. Let him be your full assurance. Fully hope. That's what it says. To what? Cleave to. Trust in. Rely on. And have faith in. That's putting everything that you've got on that one horse, right? If people have bet to understand that, when you put all your money on the one horse, it's either sink or swim, right? Or in the one attitude, those burn the boats. 
What happens? You get there and you sail there on a boat and you burn the boats. So either you win or you die. There's certain things in our life we've got to get to a place. You know what? I'm either going to win or I'm going to die trying. Well, the Bible says, when have I seen the righteous forsaken? When have I seen them begging bread? <laughs> if we understand the scriptures, we'll understand. If we get that mentality, it's either, you know, I'm going to sink or swim. You're going to swim because now you're, you're going out on faith. So, you know what? This is going to happen one way or the other. But I'm not going to let fear hold me back. I'm not going to let some type of inadequacy hold me back. So if the Bible says I can walk like Jesus, then I'm going to start walking like Jesus, and I'm not going to stop making excuses. Because an excuse is a justification for lowering your belief level. Did you catch that? An excuse is a justification for lowering your belief level. Because as soon as you make an excuse, your belief level just dropped. So what? The level of your experience with God is going to drop as well. When you stop making excuses and just trust the word of God, your belief level is going to go up. Your experience level is going to go up. And then you'll start walking on the water. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm going to keep going. Go down to John chapter 9. We're just going to kind of work our way through John for a little while. John 9, starting in verse 1. Still in the Amplified this, at this point. So just follow along. Everybody there? Okay. It says, as he passed along, he noticed a blind man from his birth. And his disciple asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? I'm just going to put the plug in here on generational curse. If Jesus was going to continue on with generational curses, this would have been a great opportunity to do so. Right? Because this was still a teaching that was common among the Jewish people at this time. Was the idea of generational curses that people's kids would suffer physically or whatever because of something their parents did or their grandparents did or somebody way back down the line, you know, and now they're suffering. That he should be born blind is the question. And Jesus answered, it was not this man or his parents sinned, but he was born blind in order that the workings of God should be manifested, displayed and illustrated in him. Did God cause it? No. But God can use it as an opportunity to say, "What? Well, look what I can do. I didn't cause this. Let me show you how to fix it. So everybody reads that verse. So see, God caused the sickness. No, because they're not understanding what's being said. Is that the works of God can be manifest. If he wasn't there, then the works of God wouldn't be manifest in him. So what is it? It's an opportunity. That what? Because the devil messed up, and now he's given the believer an opportunity to show out. Because what all of creation is waiting for, the sons of God to manifest. What? Show up and show out. That's all this was, was an opportunity. So you know what? Let me, let me show you God. You've seen what the devil does. You've seen what happens in the world. Let me show you what the Father can do. Okay? So he goes on. He says what? Verse 4. It says, we must work. Now catch this. We must work the works of him who sent me. So what's the work? What's the first thing we have to understand about the works of God? We just read it in chapter 6. We have to believe, right? So Jesus is still in the same mode of teaching and building upon the same principles. So we must work the works of him who sent me. Who must do the works? We. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> he said we. It's interesting that Jesus included them in that. The church, in many instances, in many denominations, says no, it was Jesus. As if he said, me, or I must work the works. He said, we must work the works of him who sent me. He said, it's we and me. What I'm going to demonstrate, but we're doing this together. We are doing these works. The denominations that don't believe in this stuff want to separate that out. Now they're changing what the text actually says. If you just read what it says, what? We're included. That's awesome. Everybody wants inclusion nowadays. Well, here you go. Get right with God and you're included. Everybody. To do what? Bless the entire world, not just your kingdom. So awesome. I, it's, just, it's so simple. I don't, I, don't, I don't. For me, I don't get it. I like simple things. It makes it easier for me. We must work the works of him who sent me and be busy with his business while it is daylight. What? While we are alive, while we are living. Right? Because night is coming on when no man can work. What? When you're dead, you're done. Right? When you're six feet under, you're done. There ain't no more miracles. There ain't no more going out and healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out the devils. And you're done. There ain't more speaking in tongues. There ain't no more word of prophecy, word of knowledge. You're done. 
So for my cessationist brothers, that, which is perfect, you don't need those things whenever you're with the Lord. While we're still on the earth, we still need every one of those things, and there's no scripture that says it stopped. I just want to make sure that's very clear, because there's a lot that will say that it stopped, it ceased. It, no, there's no scripture that ever says that. That's a world thinking that tried to get into the church, and it did. And there's so many people that live on that because they make themselves less than joined with Christ. Jesus already said right here, we. This is even before the cross, before the resurrection, we. So he goes on. He says what? That as long as I'm in the world, I am the world's light. And when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay, mud with his saliva, and he spread it as an ointment on the man's eyes. And he said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. So here's Jesus demonstrating, I'm the light of the world. This man was in utter darkness. He was blind. He said, what? I'm going to bring the light. It's interesting, there's another passage that says the God of this world has blinded them. The God of this world being Satan has blinded the people of this world has blinded them to seeing truth, has blinded them to receiving the gospel. We are to now be the light. Because what did Jesus say later on? Now you are the light of the world. And if we're supposed to do the same thing Jesus did, what are we supposed to do? Go heal the blind. Go show them. Go deliver them out of that blindness, out of that darkness. I'm not saying we need to go spit, make mud, and put it on their eyes, but hey, you know, if that's what's required, let's get the job done. So people want to, you know, I'm not sure we want the, you know, spit and mud ministry, but whatever. But we can't be afraid to do what the Holy Spirit leads us to do. Does that make sense? Maybe it is something off kilter. We're like, why would I do that? I don't know. The Holy Spirit said do it. I'm just going to do it. Let it make any sense. Good. You don't need to make sense. He doesn't make sense to the mind anyway. Why? Because our mind before Christ is earthly. It's base. If he's trying to grow you, he may have you do some ridiculous things that seem stupid. I end up driving out to Daytona or towards Daytona. And God says, turn around and go back. There's a revival going on. I'm like, what revival? It wasn't announced. I didn't know there was a revival going on. And it's a pitiful term, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Anyway, he said, the church is doing this. You need to go. And I was with a friend of mine. So we was like, okay, let's go back. So, I mean, we're almost to Daytona because we're going to go over there and go minister. Come back, end up going to the church. I'm like, well, what church is happening? What church are we going to? You brought me all the way back. Where are we going? Ended up at Living Waters. I had no idea they were doing the, the revival service up there. And we get in there, and I'm like, okay, Lord, you brought us back here. What's going on? And he wouldn't say nothing. And my friend's over there giggling. I'm like, you get a memo I didn't? He said, I didn't say nothing. I'm like, jerk. We, it was a good relationship. So I'm sitting there, I was like, Lord, you brought us back. I said, you know what? I'm just going to get, I'm going to worship. Great worship. I'm going to have a good time with the Lord. I'll wait for you to give me direction, God, because you brought us here for a reason. What was it? And he wasn't answering. I said, fine, I'm just going to worship. I ain't going to get upset. I ain't going to get mad. I'm just going to worship. If I was sitting there, I'm, I'm, I'm praying, and I don't know if anybody's been to Living Waters. They have actually a balcony uh, level uh, back behind and over the main uh, sanctuary. So I'm worshiping. I look back, and it's like this guy was just highlighted. Like he just stood out. A bunch of people up there. And God goes, that's the one. I'm like, that's the one what? <laughs> Go, okay. And I looked at my friend. He goes, it's about time. I'm like, you could have been more forthcoming. So we go, and we go up there, and we put hands on him. I just I felt like I was supposed to put my hands over his back. I don't know why. I was Pentecostal. I put hands on your head, right? That's what we do. We put oil on there. We lather you up, and Chris go, and boom, we knock you out. That's just what we do. Now, God said, put your hand on his heart. Put your hand on his back. I'm like, okay, so I did, and I began to pray. As I began to pray, I felt his back. I'm like, okay, that's weird. Because I've popped people's back. I've never, you know, usually I have to apply pressure for the back to get in alignment. I'm just barely touching, and I feel his back. I'm just lining up. And I'm still sitting there. I'm kind of like, okay, do I keep my hand there? Do I not keep my hand there? Because that was the first for me. And I had my hand over his heart. So I got done, and I asked him, he goes, man, that is great. He's all, he's excited, right? I'm like, so, okay, you have to answer this for me because God didn't give me the memo. I said, so what was the deal with, I, I kind of figured out the back portion of it. What was the deal with the heart? He goes, I was contemplating suicide. Tonight was either do or nothing. He goes, I've been in pain for years. And he goes, I've suffered for years and I've had no relief. And he goes, I'm, I'm done. I was going to take my life if something didn't happen tonight. He goes, I'd given up on God other than what I did here. He goes, I'd given up on everything and everybody. Medicine wouldn't touch it, nothing. 
And I'm just, I'm starting to cry at this point because I had no idea what was going on. I just don't, this is what I was supposed to do. Didn't make sense to me. None, none of it made sense. That was a lot of gas even back then because, you know, we didn't make a lot of money. I had no idea. So I'm justifying in my flesh why. And I get there and God reveals what's going on. God set him completely free. Fixed what he had going on physically. I didn't know what he had going on physically. I said, Lord, whatever he needs, you touch him right now. And I left it at that. And the rest of it was in tongues. So I have no idea what the rest of it was. And God ministered to him. Healed him right there on the spot. And it took me almost 100 miles worth of driving to do that. Think about that. So am I going to make excuses? Or am I just going to say, Lord, you know what? This is what you want me to do. I'm going to go do it. It isn't about the gas. It isn't about anything else. It's, Lord, this man's life was on the line. And you used me. I was a nobody. I didn't belong to that church. You know, it was my uncle's church. I didn't belong to the church. I didn't go there. I didn't attend there. <laughs> but God brought me back from Daytona to go over here to minister to this man. Like, I could have just went straight there and saved some time. <laughs> But it wasn't about that. Open the eyes of the blind. That man had been blinded because of his situation. God set him free. Amen? Amen. Now, again, I'm no different. I was young. I was in my 20s, like early 20s. Maybe 21, 22, give or take. So it isn't about age. It isn't about anything else. It's about the obedience. Will I do what the Lord says to do? Now, again, that would be considered a special leading because he gave me clear directions. But we have a general leaning. What's that? You see it, you free it. <laughs> right? He gave you eyes. You know, or as Curry would say, you see them, you free them. Don't bring them to me. You go get the job done. We're no different. That's the cool thing about it. You can do the same thing I can. I'm not special that way. We're all special because of Jesus. Go do the job, right? All right, so let's keep going. John 10, one chapter over. Down to verse 22. I'm just trying to build some of the things, one, that Jesus did and some of the things that Jesus said. We already see the miracle of feeding the 5,000. He's done the miracle of the 4,000. He's done all these things, right? But the miracle actually happened in the disciples' hands because that's where the multiplication actually took place. But the works of him that sent him. Jesus only did what the Father would do, and he only said what the Father would say. 10.22, John 10.22 says, Now, it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple, Solomon's porch, and then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus had been doing all kind of things that were spoken of in the prophets that would be done by the Messiah. He'd already been doing those things. And the amount that was already done should have been enough to confirm to them without him having to say a word that he was who was promised. But the God of this world had blinded them. They were looking for a political Messiah, not the Messiah. And it's funny, they're still looking for that today. It's, it's, it's just amazing to me. <clears throat> he goes on. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. So he must have already had this conversation. This must have been something that has already happened. He says, as I have said to you. Because what did Jesus do every day? He was teaching in the temples. He was ministering healing and life to people. He was delivering people. He was doing this stuff every day, not once a week. Every day he was doing this. He goes, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. This is huge. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Then Jesus answered to him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. He never said that. I mean, he did say it, but he didn't say it the way they're trying to make it. 
right? Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? <laughs> I said, you were gods? And if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blasphemed because I said, I am the Son of God? <laughs> it's so interesting. He says, and if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe the Father is in me and I in him. Say, look. Okay, so if you don't listen to anything I say, the works that I'm doing are clear, decisive, without refute of who it's from. Even if you're not going to listen to the words I say, look at the works. They speak for themselves. Isn't it interesting? We get arguing, arguing matches with people over doctrine. How about we just go out there and get the work done and say, look, who's the work pointing to, me or God? You may not believe what I'm saying. Look what I'm doing. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for the kingdom of God. It's God in me that's doing this work. Go to him. Because a true, a true believer that's doing the works of God, they're not going to take the limelight for themselves. They're going to say, they're going to pull back. No, no, no. It's Jesus that healed through me. I was available. I was the vessel. I'm doing what Jesus said to do. Go lay hands on the sick and they recover. It ain't about me. It's about his kingdom, right? And that's what he was trying to get the point across. Say, look, you guys are so religious that you can't even see what's right in front of your face. You're arguing over semantics, and what it really comes down to is you're jealous because the limelight's coming off of you, and now people are looking at me, and I'm pointing them back to the Father, which, again, is also away from them because they want all the attention. And they're upset. And he brought back the own word to them. Like, okay, your law, this is what it says. And it does. He called them gods, little g. Because what? They received the word of the Lord, and they were acting upon the word of the Lord. So it's interesting, if we actually start acting upon the word of the Lord, people are going to ask you, well, who do you think you are, God? No, but I'm like him. I'm one spirit with him. Why? Because the Bible says so. I'm supposed to be imitators of God as good children. That's what the Bible says. But you start doing that, people get all kind of upset about it. Especially the religious folks. Why? Because you might actually go out there and do the job that's supposed to be done that they're not doing. So what does it come down to? Jealousy. Pride. The things of man and the things of religion. It's terrible. So go on. It says, And therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. And there he stayed. And then many came to him and said, John performed no sign. But all the things that John spoke about this man were true, and many believed in him there. So it was John. John was the voice in the wilderness crying out, prepare the way of the Lord, make, way, you know, make the way straight. He was the forerunner. He was the one voicing everything. He didn't perform miracles. God never said anything about him performing miracles. He was a prophet. And Jesus said, look, of, of the men born of women, no one is greater than John. But in heaven, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Where are we at? In the kingdom. Even the newest babe in Christ in the kingdom is greater than John. It's a big deal. We can talk more about that another time, but I just want you to kind of get the idea. These are things that Jesus said. These are things that Jesus did. The works of the Father. He identified them. These are the works of the Father. Everything I'm doing is what? Because of unity with the Father. So what are we striving for? Unity with the Father. And if we're in unity with the Father, we're going to do these things. All right? It's, it's, there's no other way to look at it. We can make excuse or justification for it, but if we truly believe what we say we believe, then we should start backing up what we believe by what we do. John 14. I told you, I'm making it easy for you so far. <laughs> Just got to keep flipping in one direction. It works out great. Starting in verse 12. John 14, verse 12. And here's what you need to underline. If you don't already have it underlined in your Bible, you need to highlight it. Whatever you got to do, this needs to get in you. Most assuredly, without a doubt, no questions. This is how it is, right? Facts. I say to you, he, circle that, he who believes in me. The works that I do, he will do also. 
and greater works than these he will do. Because I go to my Father. Quick question. Has Jesus gone to the Father? Yes. yes. The he. Who is that? No. Wrong he. <laughs> That's us. That's anyone who believes. That's singular. So what's that? That makes it individual. He who believes. So if you are the one that believes, what will you do? Mm -hmm. The same works. The works that I do. So everything that Jesus did, you will do. And you will do greater works than this. Now, here's what happens. There's some really good teachers out there that I like, but this is one area that they try to offset what Jesus did and say, no, we're separate. That was this type of work that he did. It was this genre of work that he did. And we're, you know, it, 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 they, they dilute it instead of taking responsibility for it. They said, well, no, we, the way that it's worded, it's, it's like, yeah, we're going to do good works for God, and it's going to point to God, but it, it's not what Jesus did. It's like Jesus, but it's not what Jesus. So again, wording is very important. So they water this down and they take that responsibility off of them. Why? Because, well, we can't be like Jesus. We can't do what Jesus did. Um, he just said it. Jesus himself did. He that believes, not the apostles, not the disciples, if you will, at the time, because people want to put it, that was just on the apostolic works at the time, and that stopped with the apostles' age. You know, that was just for a certain group of people. Jesus said, he that believes. The individual that actually grasps this, does this, goes with it, he will do these things. And he goes on and says, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. What does that mean, in my name? Does anybody grasp that? What does that mean? When he says, in my name. Right. You, are, you don't have to say, in Jesus' name. You are his representative. He is in you. You go out and do. You don't even have to say it. You're doing the work in his name. Why? Because it glorifies him. But the church has made it, well, if I just say in the name, if I just say in the name of Jesus, it has to happen. No, that's not how that works. You actually have to what? What was the precursor? That? Anyone that believes. You can say all kinds of things and the devil's looking at you like, right. I don't have to move. Why? Because you don't really believe. You're just quoting something that you've heard. But when you actually believe it, it's amazing. Because what? Heaven hears and the devil is going to obey. Why? Because now God's in agreement with you because you actually do believe. You're not just saying something. You actually do believe it. And when you actually believe it, even the devil's like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Why? Because now he has to obey you. He does not have the option. When you believe, he has to obey. All right? Now, he goes on. The, what? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. So we're working out this thing as Jesus' representatives, right? We go in his name. He says, who gets the glory? The Father in the Son. Who are you? A Son. Who gets the glory? The Father. Right? So we can't make it about us. It's all about the glory of God. But what we get to operate as is a Son. So if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Does that say if you ask in my name and you have to be completely sinless? If you ask in my name, you have to know all the doctrines, all the ologies. No. If you attend this specific church with a specific title because they're the only ones that got it right. No, it's not what it says. Anything, I will do it what? It says now, there, here's another key to this though. It says what? Verse 15. If you love me, Keep my, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father, and He will what? He will give you another helper, that He may what? Oh, not just visit, right? That's live with, stay with, permanent abode. So what is that? He will ask the Father. He will get. He will. He he will. Not might, maybe. He will do this. So again, this is part of establishing in you that the Father said He's going to do it. He's done it. It's up to you. Said, okay, thank you. Receive it. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, who can't receive it? World. So if you're having difficulty receiving, then what's the issue? The world. You got world in the way. So what do you got to do? Kill it. 
get that out of the way because the world can't receive it. Why? Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you, but you know him. Why? For he dwells with you and will be in you. So now we're shifting from Old Testament to new. Old covenant relationship to new covenant relationship. This is what he's preparing them for. It's like, look, you're seeing me. I'm the representation of that. I'm the physical representation. But no longer will I be with you. I'm going to be in you through what? The Holy Spirit. And he goes, what? Right after that. I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. What? I will not leave you helpless. I will not leave you without the ability to do what needs to be done. Powerless. Right? Too much of the church still operates as an orphan. They operate as powerless, ineffective, weak. They still operate as servants, not sons. Because of what? They don't want to grow up. Because when you grow up, you've got to take responsibility. And that's what it comes down to. They don't want to take responsibility. But this is what Jesus says. If Jesus says it, who are we to argue with it or come up with our own doctrines that says something contrary? Or somehow less than what he says? I actually had to go back and look at this one person's thoughts on this a couple times to make sure I caught what he was saying. I'm like, I, one, I couldn't believe this individual was saying it. It really floored me. Because on most points, he's a solid teacher. But because of, I can tell it's what he was trained in, that's what he was regurgitating. He said, just read the scripture and do what it says. Keep it simple, right? So, if we're going to be like Jesus, we have to understand that what? We operate as he operates, and we have power, we have authority, we have dominion. All these things we have discussed numerous times. But do you believe it? If you do, we walk different, we talk different, we act different, we live different. Let's go over to Luke 9. Again, I'm going to kind of keep it simple. We're going to kind of walk through Luke. One teacher went through Luke. He, he spent almost three years teaching through the book of Luke. <laughs> three years. And after looking at it, I'm like, yep. And I, I think he cut it short. Just from going through one book, it was absolutely amazing. Luke 9, starting in verse 1. And I'll be using the Weist translation for this because I want to bring out a little bit of stuff. Um, but just listen. It says, Then, having called together the twelve, he gave them power and authority over all the demons, and over diseases to be healing them. And he sent them off on a mission to be heralding forth. And most of your translations will say preach, right? That term there, preach, in the original language is heralding forth the kingdom of God with that formality, gravity, and authority which must be listened to and obeyed. That's the idea when he says preaching, that's what he means. That you are a herald. Everybody understand what a herald is, what that looked like? So say that a king is getting ready to come into a region. Well, before the king came into that region, there would be a person going out with a loud voice, declaring, hey, the king is coming. Kind of like whenever, uh, what was his name, the, 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 Paul Revere or whatever, the, when they had the red coats are coming. He was heralding, hey, this is getting ready to take place. Was he quiet about it? No, he was speaking with such urgency. Look, you need to get your house prepared. This is getting ready to happen. You need to be ready for war. Why? Because it's happening now. So he didn't just go out there, hey, it'd be a good idea for you to do this, you know, if you really want to. Yeah, if you, if you feel okay with it. No, he said, look, this has to happen. This has to happen now. But he spoke with such an authority and passion about it, what? That it must be listened to and obeyed. Because there's ways of speaking that people will be drawn to. It gets their attention. And they're like, eh, whatever. There's other ways that says, you know what? No, this guy's for real. I really need to listen. I may not understand it, but I need to listen to what they're saying. When you have that type of speech about you, it's going to change the way people listen to you. Because you have to, be, you have to believe what you're saying. So the question is, do you believe what you're saying when you're speaking? Okay? This is what gets people's attention. This is what will break down those walls of just tuning you out. All right, and he goes, what? And to be healing. He said, look, he called them together. This is what you have to do. I've given you this. Does it say anywhere in Scripture that he ever rescinded that? That he took back the authority? Nowhere. But people want to say that it died out. It doesn't just die out. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. If he gave a command, 
it's still in operation. But then they tried to limit it to just the 12, right? Because of that verse. Just hang on, we'll get there. Go down to verse 6. And going forth, they kept on going through the villages, village by village, proclaiming the good news and healing everywhere. Who did the healing? They did. What? Everywhere they went. And they didn't stop. They kept going. They kept doing these things. Why? Because Jesus never told them to quit doing it. So they kept on. It's interesting. We think we're waiting on the special leading that I can do it one time. And then, okay, I did it. No, if Jesus is telling you to do something, you keep doing it. This is why it was so difficult for me for many years to sit back and not be sharing, not be doing. Because why? God told me to do that. And to try to sit back and not do that, it got in. Mm -hmm. Because what? I know it was clear from the Lord. Hey, this is what you are to do. And for me to not do that, it irritated me. And it frustrated me. And within me, it, I wasn't mad at people, but within me, I'm like, I, I was like, Corey, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You need to be doing this. Now, I can make an excuse for why I didn't or whatever. I, I, that doesn't, doesn't fill, you know, fix the hole in the boat. I can't make an excuse. I just didn't do what I needed to be doing. But God was working some stuff out of me even through that to make me better, to grow me, to mature me in some areas, right? So I don't knock the experience. I don't knock and you know give the devil the glory. No, I thank God because what? He still works stuff out of me and to him be the glory for it. But I'm telling you, whenever God tells you to do something, if you don't ever hear him say stop doing it, then you keep doing it until he tells you otherwise, right? Noah building a boat. God told him once, build the boat, told him how to do it. Then God went quiet. 100 plus years. What did Noah do? He kept building the boat. <laughs> Just because God get quiet don't mean you stop building the boat. Some of you might have gotten quiet because you haven't heard God speak to you in a while. So what do you do? You go off the last order he gave you. Build the boat. Okay? Go over to Luke chapter 10. When you get there, let me know. I think I'm at the beginning of the verse. I don't remember. Yeah, Luke chapter 10. Yeah, it's at the beginning. Starting verse 1. It says, Now, after these things, the Lord appointing how many? 72 others. Oh, 70 others. 72 others. Some say 70, some say 72. Either way, he sent them out two by two. So who was that? Other than the 12. So now we have at least, what, 82 to 84 people going out doing work. And these weren't the apostles, okay? They were apostles technically because they were sent out on mission, but that's a whole other story if you want to understand the definition of the words, All right? Now, sent them on mission two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to come or go, right? And he was saying to them, the harvest indeed is great, but the workers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to... That seems so nice and friendly to send out. Oh, just, I'm going to send you on mission. No, no, no. The actual Greek on that is to thrust, to cast, to throw forcefully out into the harvest. It's not this gentle, oh, if you really want to go. <laughs> I think of the old westerns where they threw them out, the those little swinging doors of the, of the saloon, right? Or they throw them out of the window. That's, that's what comes to my mind for whatever reason whenever I hear that. Just thrust them out. Praise God. Go! And just you know, start throwing people out. Could you imagine that going by a church and all of a sudden see people being thrown out the door? And they go, like, what was going on with that church? Well, I think he was thrusting them out into the harvest. You know, I, it just, but that's what comes into my mind because it's a forceful moving out. But what do we do? We hang on at the doorpost. No, I don't want to go. I'm not comfortable with that. I don't, I'm not equipped. I don't know what to do. And we're hanging on with everything so we don't get thrust out into the harvest. But we're supposed to pray, Lord, thrust them out. You know, get them out. Make, you know what? I pray the Lord makes you uncomfortable so you go out and actually start doing the work of the kingdom. Right? Because it would make all of our lives a whole lot easier. Many hands make the work light. If we all do our jobs, man, it gets so much easier. So it goes on. And uh, where is that? And go, yeah, be going on your way. Go down to verse 8. And into whatever city you are entering, and they are welcoming you, be eating the things set before you, be healing those who in it who are ill, right? And be saying to them, the kingdom of God has come near you and is at hand. 
said, look, you go there, you eat, you enjoy those that welcome you in, utilize it, accept it, and heal those that are sick. What? Those that are sick, all of them. He didn't just say a limited few, heal them all. Those that are sick, heal them, right? And what? Declare to them the kingdom near you and it's a hand. Well, what kingdom? Where was it at? In them. They represented the kingdom. They were the kingdom, right? It wasn't that they just were the represent. That's who they were. That's who you are. You are the kingdom. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom, that's you, right? Go down to verse 17. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are marshalling themselves under our orders in your name. And he said to them, now I love how this is translated out. He goes, and most of you say, well, and behold, I saw Satan fall like lightning. It's very short. He goes, I was beholding with a calm, intent, continuous contemplation, Satan having fallen in one fell swoop from heaven like lightning. He's like, look, I looked at this and I saw it for what it was. I didn't just, oh, wow, oh, and that was it. I really thought about it. I, I was really intent on what was happening whenever he was cast out. So what? It wasn't like, it was oh, surprise. No, this happened. But it wasn't a big deal. What, he, was lower, he was cast out of heaven. He's, he's lost all of it. He goes on and says, Behold, I have given, have given you the authority to advance by setting foot upon snakes and scorpions and over all the power. That term power there actually means the ability of the enemy. He's given you the power to step forward and move forward over all the ability of the enemy. So it doesn't matter how big and bad he thinks he is, God's given you the power to step on him and put him in his place. Right? He goes on. He says, and nothing, no thing, will in any case harm you. And he goes, and nevertheless, in this do not continue to rejoice. <laughs> Namely, because the spirits marshal themselves in subjection under your orders, but be rejoicing that your names have been written in heaven and are on the permanent record up there. When something is a matter of course, it doesn't surprise you. Right? It's every day, not a big deal, it's just what you do. For them, he say, look, you need to get to a place where this is every day. This isn't, oh, wow, ooh, ah. He said, this is, this is what you should expect. And now, honestly, that's kind of the highest level of faith that you can get to. It's just a straight expectancy of how things are supposed to be. So if something happens outside of that, that's when you're like, oh, wait a minute. That's not how that's supposed to be. You know, Brother Curry was in a situation, and, you know, they come to him and told him that something was going on. He goes, huh. And he left it at that. And the guy went back to him. He goes, what, what did you mean by huh? He goes, well, I'm not used to losing. So when the situation didn't go according to what he was expecting, his response was, huh. He didn't come up with a justification, a rationalization, or anything else. He just said, huh. And after that, what did he do? He went to the Lord and said, Lord, you sent me to do this. This is what they're telling me. That's not how this is going to roll. Right? He said, you called me to do this. This is how it's going to be, or I'm done. Again, this wasn't trying to manipulate God, but he's like, look, Lord, your word says, and I'm not backing off what your word says. This is how it's going to be. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm not taking, well, this happened. That's how, it, no. This is how it's going to operate. Why? Because it's your word. So, so at that point, Curry could have backed off his faith, could have made an excuse for why things didn't go the way they were supposed to go, instead of saying, you know, I'm not changing my story. I'm not changing my tune. This is how it's going to be. So if somebody says something contrary to that, you're like, hmm. And they're going to ask you later on, what do you mean by huh? Because that's not how it's supposed to go. I'm not settling for less. I'm not going to back off my faith. If I said this is how it's going to be, but that's how I expect it to be. Well, it didn't happen that way. It hadn't happened that way yet. Does that make sense? You can come up, well, I guess it wasn't God's timing. Oh, God must have a purpose. Oh, this must not be the season. How does that sound like faith? If I speak as the oracles of heaven, then I'm expecting that thing to happen the way I said it's going to happen. That's not arrogance. That's not being cocky. That's not being anything else. That's, no. If I'm supposed to speak with a certain amount of authority, I can't back off that authority. 
Because if I back off of it, then what? It doesn't have to listen. All right, with your kids, if you back off, those of you who have kids, if you back off what you said, they're going to figure out after a while, hey, they're just going to back off, so I really don't have to listen to them. But when you say it in a certain way, they're going to, uh, okay, they mean business. I better just go ahead and do what's supposed to be done. If we speak like that on a regular basis, especially when it's regarding our enemy, guess what? He's going to realize, nope, I have to listen. And what's going to happen, the only time you're going to get surprised is when he doesn't listen. And then what do you do? Just like you do with a child. I said no. Right? Apparently you didn't get it the first time I said no. I'm not changing my tune. No means no. You stop now. But if you don't actually say that like you mean it, just like a child, he's going to look at you like, nah, whatever. I don't mean nothing to me. Why? Because you don't, you're not speaking with authority. You're not speaking with dominion. You're not speaking with rulership. You're just speaking to speak. Make yourself feel better that you said something. I don't have to listen to that. Your kids know the same thing. They know when they have to listen and when they don't. Am I wrong, parents? They know. It's learning to tell you that. You don't have to be loud about it. There are certain times you can look at your house and say, that is no. You ain't got to be loud. They're like, oh, crap. I've got to listen. Kids, you know it too. When parents, sometimes your parents speak, they're like, hmm. And sometimes they ain't even got to speak. They turn at you, and you can almost hear the head turn. And you're like, mm -mm. and you just get it done. They say a thing. Why should it be any different with us as believers? When we turn, and all that we should have to do is look at a situation. And they'll be like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And he, he exits the stage left. We don't have to make a production out of it. There's so many people that want to make a production out of deliverance and out of everything else. Hey, look, if that's what it's doing to get the job done, whatever. But I don't want believers getting roped into the idea that you have to make a production out of something to get somebody delivered. Where it has to become this big show. It has to be... Jesus sometimes would just look and things would happen. He would give a word of command and at a distance, things would happen. And we're so busy thinking we have to make a show out of it. We don't have to make a show. I got testimonies. I prayed with a lady over a phone for her dad. I never met her or her dad. She calls me the next day. Hey, I just want to let you know dad's out of the hospital. Okay. That's what I expected. She goes, what do you mean? That's what we prayed. I didn't expect anything less. Now I feel like, oh, really? He's out of the hospital? That's not faith. That's like, oh, I was surprised. No, I wasn't surprised. And again, I don't say that to be arrogant. It just sh shouldn't be a surprise whenever God does what he says he will do because you were obedient and did what you were supposed to do. It should be that level of expectancy. So let's move on. So again, he says, look, you want to celebrate something? Celebrate your salvation. Celebrate your name being in the Lamb's Book of Life, right? Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10. Starting in verse 1, and then we're going to go down to verse 5. Say amen when you get there. Amen. Matthew 10. All right. It says, And having called to himself his twelve disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to be ejecting them. I like that eject. It still comes about that idea of forcefully throwing something out. It's awesome. And to be, <laughs> bless you. And to be healing every disease and every sickness. I love how it says to be healing. Not to go and do it one time. It's a continuous thing to be doing this thing on a regular basis. Right? And your translation probably says to heal the sick and to cast out whatever. It's a, it's a shortened form of that. But when you really start looking at it, it's a, an ongoing process. Right? It never stops. It says these 12 Jesus sent off on a mission. Having given them charge, say into you know, say into, into the road of the Gentiles, do not go forth, and into the city of the Samaritans, do not go, but be gone. Because at this point, he's, he's limiting their exposure. At, right now, in Matthew ten, he's saying, "Look, I want you to keep it focused on this group." Right. That's the only thing he kept limited was the focus, and you'll see that shortly. I just want to make sure you catch that. He's saying here, this was the focus, and some people say, "Well, this is all he." There are teachers that will say this is all he sent them to was the Jews and the lost sheep. He says, stay with me. He says, but be going on your way rather to the sheep of the house of Israel 
sheep who have been neglected and have lost their way and are now wandering about without guidance. Moreover, and I think your translation probably says sheep without a shepherd, right? It says, moreover, as you go, make a public proclamation with such formality. Again, here it is, the whole idea of preaching. Formality, gravity, and authority as much must be listened to and obeyed, saying the kingdom of heaven has come near and is imminent. B, healing those who are sick. B, raising the dead. Lepers, be cleansing. Demons, be ejecting. In a, gratu a gratuitous manner, you have received, and in a gratuitous manner, give. Everybody wants to associate this with money. This has absolutely nothing to do with money. <laughs> You've been given power and authority to do the work of God. Do it freely. <laughs> Why? Because God so loved you that he set you free. You should love others, set them free. This verse has absolutely zero to do with money. But how often does this verse get used in regards to money? Freely you've been given. God didn't freely give me money. I went out and worked. What? By the sweat of your brow, you will eat. What? You're going to work. As you sow, you reap. Now, understanding God blesses your work. He will bless your hands. He will do these things. Okay, you get, Sometimes work will become where it's not even work to you when you're in the kingdom. Outside of the kingdom, you're going to sweat. You're going to toil. You're really going to have to go after it. Inside the kingdom, it's like, man, you touch it, it turns to gold. It just starts coming. It's like it doesn't make sense. That's if you're trusting God. Okay, but anyway, do you catch what I'm saying here? He gave them, this is what I want you to do. This was a command. This is a key thing here. This was a command that Jesus gave them to go and do. Right? And again, he never told them to stop doing these things. We have no record of him saying this stopped. Right? Now, some will say, they'll try to take the verse out of uh, Corinthians where he was dealing with, to some was given this gift, to some was given that gift. Everybody is given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those gifts that are mentioned there are the ones that people seem to be elevated in. Right? It's, some of these guys are going to operate like in this gift. Man, they're going to they're gonna go after it. Somebody... What? Our natural bent. We all have natural tendencies where we tend to go towards certain things. Why? Because we find an area that works and that's what we operate in. Right? Some of our generals of the faith, if you will, some of them operated in a word of knowledge. And it was ridiculous how well that word of knowledge went. Some of them was just an operation of faith. Man, they would just do things by faith. It was like, wow. It was just absolutely amazing. Right? Because it was like on a whole other level. Because what? That's what they grew into. It wasn't a limitation. It's just, that's what they went to. Certain kids, right? We all have, some of us in here have multiple children. Each one of them has grown into who they are. They have a natural bent. What? And they excel at certain things that the other ones don't. It's not that they didn't have the same gifting, the same opportunity. They just, this is the path that they went down. That's what they excelled in. It's not a, a differentiation or an elevation or anything else. It's just, that's the area that they chose. That's what Paul was dealing with. But the command was what? To go do these things. It wasn't based on whether you had the gift of faith or the gifts of healings or that. Jesus said, go and do these things. Everybody wants to say, well, if you have this gift, you can do it. No. That's just certain ones that people operate in. Again, it, it, and who was the church, uh, the letter of Corinth written to? The most carnal church, the most worldly church. That's who that letter was written to that had to have the most explanation of the gifts and operation of the gifts and everything else. But we keep on wanting to say that's the epitome. No, that's the bottom. The church at Ephesus was the church to go to. That was the go-to church. Those guys had it going on. So now we go to Matthew 28. Now everybody gets included. Verse 18, Matthew 28, verse 18. We all know this is the what? The Great Commission. Co-mission. Joined mission. Joined purpose, right? And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So who has all authority? He does. He does. He has all authority, right? And that actually is authority there. And he says, Go therefore. Go therefore what? And make this right? Of what? All the nations. So we're supposed to go out there and disciple. Well, actually, the idea there is you go disciple all nations. I didn't just make them. You go out with the intention of discipling the nation. But he said, because of my all authority, that's what I want you to go in. I'm telling you now to go in my all authority. So when you operate as him, 
You operate in his all authority, not your authority. Why? Because your authority is probably limited. His isn't. You operate in his all authority because he has all of it, right? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. And I had to actually add this in there. It says, be attending to, carefully holding firmly to, and observe all things that I have commanded you or enjoined upon you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he's going to all the world to what? Teach them to observe what? To obey and to do. That's what observation is. To listen and to do all the things that what? I commanded you. Well, what did he command them back in Matthew 10? Go do these things. There's a lot of other commandments that Jesus gave to the disciples or to the apostles. He commanded them to do certain things. And he said what? All things I commanded you. Not some things. He said, all things that I commanded you to do. That's what you're supposed to disciple them in. Why? Because he's with them. All right? And then, you know, one of the verses that I talk about a lot is out of Matt, or Mark 16. Right? It says, later he appeared to them, Mark 16, starting to verse 14. Most of y'all should probably have this already underlined in your Bible. <clears throat> This is still part of the same thing, part of the Great Commission. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at table and rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who he had sent. Probably because it was a woman preacher. Just saying. The first ones that came back from the tomb were women. They were preaching the gospel. So the problem, people have a problem with women preaching the good news, they, they're going to have issues with this one. Or they just read over it and they don't want to accept it for what it is. Anyway, <clears throat> they said to them, go into what? All the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. Right? If you want to preach to your dog and cat, go for it. It says every creature. It actually the idea is to preach to every nation. You know what I'm saying? But again, every creature. All of creation declares the goodness of God and the glory of God. So, I mean, whatever. If we're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. Pre if you want to take that literal and talk to every creature, go for it. I don't think you would be out of bounds doing so. I just don't think you're going to get the harvest that you can get out of it. <clears throat> but I don't think you're out of bounds either. Right? <laughs> so, it, it's, just, it's just funny. But again, like I said, I don't think you'd be out of bounds doing it. There's nothing that says not to. Now, because the Bible talks about ownership of our pets and taking care of the animals that God has given us. We're supposed to. I mean, that, that's just what the Bible says. It says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned or damned depends on which uh, version you're reading. And these signs will follow those who what? Believe. So how did we start this off? What did you say? Those He that believes, right? These signs will follow those that believe. So now he's expanding on what happens when you believe. And this also confirms what? Matthew 10. In my name, they will or shall Cast out demons. They will or shall speak new tongues. They will or shall take up serpents. There make, there's actually the serpents there is actually talking about political issues. Taking to those people that are crafty in their speech and things like that. But it's funny, nothing new under the sun, right? Jesus said, look, they'll know how to deal with them. And I believe it actually applies to literal serpents as well. Because what, later on we see where Paul shook off the viper that had bit him, which should have killed him. And he just like, eh, whatever. And shook it off into the fire like it was no big deal. Right? Because he took what you said literally. Nothing by any means shall harm me. Why? Because I'm doing the work of the kingdom. So he goes on. <clears throat> and they will drink, if, you know, if they drink any of that other thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, which we know that. And what the Bible declares that we are seated with him in heavenly places. And verse 20, catch this. And they went out and preached everywhere. The idea of preaching is back to what we said earlier. What? Formality, gravity, and authority. As must be listened to and obeyed. And the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Or miracles, right? So the Lord worked with them as they went. It's hard for the Lord to work with you if you're not going. It's hard for him to confirm the word that you have if you're not doing anything with the word you have. Right? We're the same as Jesus. We're not him, but we're the same as. 
Christian, little Christ-like one. When we go, we go in His all authority. If we truly begin to get this and grasp this and walk in this, what is Jesus going to do? Just what He did there. He's going to confirm the Word with the accompanying signs and wonders or miracles. Why? Because you're going out walking in faith because you believe. So now you're doing something with you believing, and your believing is enacting the faith, and the faith is causing the stuff to happen. And who gets the glory? God. But that right there, that brings confirmation to the word that you're preaching, that it's true. And the idea of knowing whose word it is and whose kingdom you're building is what? It's going to point back to God. You're not going to take the glory for it. You're going to point it back to the Father. But then at that point now, you're going to invite them in to fellowship and into a discipleship relationship. Why? Because now it's time for them to grow because we're commanded to make disciples. But we go, show the works of God. God does what He does. It draws people in because why? It's hard to argue with a miracle. It's hard to argue with someone that was dealing with something and now they're completely set free from it and they're like, uh. Right? So now you're not getting into debate over doctrine or theology. You're dealing with someone that just got delivered, healed, set free, made whole, right? Saved, <laughs> right? Or saved out of at this point. It's hard to argue with that. And that presents an opportunity right now to share the kingdom, right? That's why I said the kingdom of God is at hand. What is that kingdom? You just experienced it. And let me tell you how it makes that possible. It's Jesus. He's the one that died for you, a son who had lost his way to make you perfect, to make you right, to bring you home, to put you back in right standing with the Father. Because even in this, without coming to him, you're at war with him. But even though you're an enemy combatant, he still reaches down and heals you. He still reached down and delivered you. He still reached down and showed his love to you, even though you're at war with him. Most of us wouldn't do that. Someone that we're at war with, we wouldn't reach out to help them. We wouldn't reach out to bless them, but Jesus makes it clear. If you're going to do something, bless those that curse you. Pray for those that despitefully use you. What are we doing? We're doing the opposite of what the world does. And unfortunately, we're doing the opposite of what most churches do. You know, the church really is backwards in so many ways. But when we get to the place, we, all, we acknowledge who we are. We acknowledge that we're sons. We acknowledge and truly believe and walk out what we believe. That's what's going to change lives. It isn't a good message. It isn't a feel-good message. It isn't a motivational speech. I, I, I'm just going to be transparent. I, I have issues with a lot of these motivational preachers. That's all they are. They're a bunch of hype and a bunch of fluff. They'll bring up a scripture, but at the end of the day, if you really look at what they're saying, don't take my word for it. Go look at it. You guys have got enough word in you. By now, you can start identifying what I mean by fluff and what I mean by feel good. Because at the end of the day, all that fluff and feel good is just like cotton candy. When the water of life hits it, it just shrivels up and you're left with nothing. You're left empty. You're left still hurting. You should not still be hurting. You should not still be dealing with trials and things in your life. If you've taken it to Jesus, you be, should be set free from those things. It doesn't mean you don't still go through them. They just don't go through you. Does that make sense? Yes, you're there. Yes, you see it. Yes, you're, you understand it. But it doesn't have the ability to rob your joy. It doesn't have the ability to rob your peace. It doesn't have the ability to come in and Shanghai the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. But if you're trying to rely on a feel-good fluff message, it's going to fall apart, and you're like, well, well I guess i got to go back next week so I can get another feel-good. That's the, what the Bible talks about, those that have itchy ears. It's just like a dog. You scratch a dog's ear just right, boy, they'll follow your hand wherever you want it to go. And these preachers do that with their feel-good messages, that people follow them wherever they go, even if that takes them straight to hell. That bothers me. It isn't about the numbers that are in the seats. While I think it's important, but if that becomes your goal, you, you'll stop preaching the full truth. You'll hit little nuggets here and there, but you're not going to preach the full gospel. Because the full gospel starts with repentance. It starts with a change of life. It starts with a change of your character before men and before God. This year, 
our family, we made the stand. We're, not, we're, we're no longer going to be celebrating Halloween. We're no longer going to be participating in it. It becomes such a conviction on me, and I've been dealing with it for some time. And then my wife says, yeah, it's been bothering me too for the past few weeks. And I didn't say nothing to her. I didn't say a word. I'm like, Lord, if this is you, you're going to bring the confirmation. But this is where I'm at. And I, and I told him, I sat down, and, she, and she's like, yeah, I agree. This has actually been bothering me. Because the Bible says what? We're not supposed to participate in any of the fruitless works of evil. We're not supposed to be partnered with it. We're not supposed to join in with it. For years, we've justified it. We're guilty. We justified it. We made it okay. Well, we're just going to go get candy. They're dressing up in something nice. They're doing whatever. I'm not telling you what you should do. I'm telling you what we did. And it's based on the Word of God. Again, it, we have to make a stand. The Bible says we have to come out from among the, the world. We're supposed to be different and separate. But if we're out there hanging out with them and partying with them and doing the same things they're doing, how are we separate? We're not. Now, we don't do it from a judgmental or whatever attitude. But we, we, love, we lovingly say, no, that's, we don't participate in that. It's not because I think I'm better. It's just because God's called me to be different. I love you. Let me, let me talk to you about Jesus. Let me show you the love of Jesus. Not condemn them. We can bring a holy conviction by preaching truth. And let the Lord work that out. That's what draws men to repentance. Not us judging them and saying, oh, you know, you're all going to hell. Because you know there's going to be people out there that say they're believers out there with signs. You're going to hell! Maybe they just haven't grown up yet. Maybe they are a believer. They just haven't grown up yet. You can't judge whether they're going to hell or not. That's not your place. And those people, I'd like to have a conversation with them. I've been tempted to quite a few times. I'm like, nope, now I'm getting into arguments that the Bible tells me not to get into. <laughs> right? Because that's not showing the love of Christ. Our job, let's go be Jesus. Right? Not just in word, but in action. If we believe, we'll do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We give you glory and honor. We lift you up in this place, Father. Lord, let our believing result in doing. And let our living be that, the life of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, let it bring a holy conviction to us. And let it bring reverence out of us for you and your word. But Lord, let it stir love within us. Your word says that we're to provoke one another to love and to good works. Lord, I pray this morning that your word has done that. Not me. <laughs> Not anything that's of this flesh, but your word and your spirit has provoked those that are here to love and to good works. That we build your kingdom, Father, not our own. And Father, that we walk in faith, not fear. That we truly do what everybody's, you know, sign faith over fear. That we're living that out. That we're showing that. That we're being that. And Father, that we're loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. And that we're loving you first. Father, we just thank you. We bless you for this day. We bless you for this time, Lord, as we, we come now to sing songs of praise and worship to you, God. Receive it as a sweet-smelling aroma. And Father, minister to those that are in this room this morning in a way only that you can. That they can't say that it was a man that touched them, that it was you that touched them this morning. And Father, that you get the glory. That whatever it is that they have need of, whatever it is that's right now stirring in their mind, Lord, I just I, I believe that you're, you've stirred something this morning in them. That there, there is a, that's another way to say it. There's a stirring right now happening in your, your thoughts. Lord, that you will settle them. That it wouldn't just be something that muddies the water, but it makes the water clear. Lord, maybe they've been contemplating something this morning. That today is the day of decision. That today is the day of your holy conviction that says, hey, this is how you operate going forward. It's not a loss. It's a victory for the kingdom. It's an addition, not a loss. Because we're adding more of you. We're adding more of who you are. You know, we, we sing the song, we want more of you. But Father, I believe that's what you're speaking to us. I believe that song is you singing to us. I believe that was your spirit speaking to the writer saying, I want more of you. And Father, I believe that's what you're saying to us this morning. You want more of us. Because Father, we couldn't handle any more of you. Because you've already given us everything. It's more of us that you're desiring. So Father, let us lay that down this morning. Let us lay ourselves down. 
our wants, our desires, our feelings, our justifications, all those things that are contrary to your spirit. Father, let us lay those down this morning. Let us run into your arms. <laughs> let us be held by you and be loved by you. Oh, Oh, Jesus. Oh, man. This morning, let, just let him hold you this morning. Let him wrap his arms around you. He's such a good father. He just desires so much to love on his children. And to be loved by them. Lord, you're good.